Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to part four of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way. We're getting into some valuable insights from this week's guests that you can definitely apply to your own journey. Please definitely stay tuned for advice and inspiration that can help us all. If you missed the first part of the week in part one, two, and three, definitely go back. The show notes should be filled with all the links, so go and click on them if you need to catch up. Also, definitely subscribe to the channel and all the other ones if you can. It's going to really help the show. But for now, enjoy the rest of the story. In Australia, we have the Medicare system where the government covers these costs. So if we had have lived in in America, we would have had to mortgage the house and come up with our $100,000 for that injection or just miss out. You know, I would have just not had treatment and have to just hope that the cancer didn't spread. Like, that's wild. So we are so lucky, so grateful that we were somewhere that, you know, the 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 um country was just going to pay for it for us so yes jake yeah. raised that money but also we were just given this treatment for free like that's crazy so yeah. you know we took away that information we were like a bit shocked but off we went to the relay for life we cancelled our dinner we didn't feel like eating <laughs> but we went yeah. to the relay for understandable life. <laughs> yeah and here we are you know walking laps and raising money for cancer and it's just sinking in a little bit as we're walking and, yeah. you know, as, as they start these speeches, they light these candles for the people that have passed and then they start sight moment silences. And then they, then they do a speech about, about cancer and then they have people on to talk about people they've lost or eventually someone will come on that was lucky to survive and they'll, they'll be there to talk about how our money that we're raising is, you know, hopefully going to, to save more lives. We didn't quite make it that far that evening. We um, <laughs> we we heard the first story and I just couldn't deal. You know, you're listening yeah. to someone who has lost someone to cancer and I've just been told I've got breast cancer. It was just too much. So Jake and I decided to go home. <laughs> and Did you just, tell anybody? We actually, we didn't really, I'm trying to remember it's one of those things I think I've blocked a little bit from my memory. I know I tell my mum everything. My mum and I are best besties and we're very close. So I'm pretty certain I told her, but I don't remember how I don't remember when I, I I don't know, but I do remember telling anyone at the run. I did tell one friend I was there with a, a long best friend from a long time ago. And so I told her and she just hugged me and she was like, you're going to be okay. And you know, you told her this at the run. Yeah, we were walking a lap and I told her and I think I just felt I needed to explain why we were leaving. Yeah. Felt like we yeah. looked like jerks to just be like, and we're going to go now. <laughs> and I wouldn't, that's when I was wondering, like, did you tell somebody at the run? I mean, it doesn't matter if you look like yeah. a jerk in the moment because it would have come out and they would have totally understood anyway. But I was yeah, just wondering, did you tell anyone there? T- yeah. 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 So we yeah, did. Wow. I sort of said to Jake, I think I'm going to tell my friend. And he's like, yeah maybe you should so I told her and she was like go home go and process it digest it like you guys are amazing for coming and so yeah we went home and and I remember telling the rest of my family I actually remember telling I did tell my dad um and my mum separately but I I remember asking my mum to tell my brothers for me and I remember telling Jake to please tell his family for like I just couldn't I couldn't keep saying it. It just felt so surreal. And I was like, I don't even want to tell work. You know, you've got to like, you've got to go to work on Monday. This is a Friday night. So, you know, I messaged my boss and he was incredible. He, his wife had, uh, was a breast cancer survivor, he is a breast cancer survivor. Yeah. So he was very understanding. He was like, you know, take the time you need. So I was very lucky to have those people around me, you know, like work was understanding, my friends were understanding, my family unit was amazing. And then I had Jake who couldn't be any better in that situation, especially. So yeah, yeah we were in a good place to start such a scary journey. Um, um, many people don't think about those side of things. I mean, they don't even think they're going to get it themselves, like you've mentioned. And and, mm. and I agree completely. You don't ever think this is ever going to happen to you. But when it does, you just then solely think on the cancer part. You don't think about the work and you don't think about telling siblings and, and stuff like that. There's the more yeah. trauma effects to it. And and oh, even yeah. just work, I, 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 you know, if imagine you didn't have a supportive boss. 
the how many stress that it was, bosses yeah. are out there you know i'm big on leadership and you can see behind me what i did and what where my oh, yeah. the reason why i'm doing leading our own way but mm. so many crap bosses out there who don't have perspective um you i mean the question is would your boss have been just as supportive if he didn't have a cancer a wife who had supported yeah. it. you know what i mean i'm right. not saying he's a bad person i'm not saying that would have happened no, he still probably yeah. still would have done it hopefully yeah. he still would have done it but perspective changes when you've been through yeah. the crisis yourself and if you haven't do you, they really ever fully understand you know yeah yeah to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes it's yeah, yeah not always easy so yeah. no yeah you're right it was hard to to tell people and you feel like a massive amount of guilt Every time you tell someone you're breaking their heart because they're scared for you or they're sad for you and you just feel so bad that you just make – I don't like making people feel bad. So yeah. even though, yeah, I'm the one that's about to go through this treatment, I was feeling really crap to to be hurting people, people to, you know, for them to yeah. be sad. I didn't like doing that. So I was like, can you all just tell everyone for me? I'm going to go hide now. <laughs> so, so. So, yeah, yeah. so the next few weeks – what do the next few weeks look like for you guys in terms yeah. of feelings and treatment? Where does that journey then go? Yeah. So I guess like I went into a headspace probably thanks as soon as, as soon as I heard Jake say, like he looked me dead in the eye and he was like, you are going to live. Like you, you are hundred percent are going to be okay. And I'm like, yeah, I love it. even if that's not true, I'm going to believe that I'm going to take that and I'm going to just hold on to that. Cause what's the point? Like, obviously you have moments where you, you panic or worry, but mm. what is the point? It, you know, how, how are you going to get through something this big if, if you're not going to truly believe that mm. it's going to be fine and just motivate yourself? So I was mm. like, no, nah, get into this headspace where it's going to be fine, um, but you're not going to talk about it. So it's sort of told work, but I was explained that I didn't want to talk about it. I want to still come to work. It sounds ridiculous, but I want to come. The kids, you know, the students at school, they'll distract me. I'll be busy. Otherwise, I'm at home just thinking about it. So mm. I chose to go to work and they wanted to act really quickly. The doctors did. So they were like, it's really fast growing. We need to, to get you in for surgery. So the surgery is going to be like within, within the week. And wow. as soon as you've had your surgery, we will be starting your chemotherapy like like as soon as you're healed, as soon as your body's able to start taking another blow, we're going to start your chemo and it's the hardest, harshest chemo, chemo drug we've got. You'll lose your hair. You'll, you know, you'll feel super sick. You won't be able to work. And I was like, okay. And at the same time as all of this COVID, COVID arrived. So hmm. not only was I going for surgery for my breast cancer to be removed, but I had to go in alone. Like you were not allowed anybody in there with you. You can have anyone to say goodbye. No one you just drop you off at the gate. See you later. So Jake drove me. Yeah. He drove me. I had my surgery. I was very scared. I'd never really had a massive, I'd had my little keyhole surgeries and wisdom teeth, but I'd never had a big thing like that. So no. you, know, you wake up and you're in recovery and you're just by yourself and everyone's wearing masks and COVID's all a thing and strangers. Yeah, the whole of chemotherapy was COVID, COVID, COVID. You just couldn't, you couldn't have anybody there holding your hand. And then mm. I had a needle phobia. What a joke. <laughs> like I, I was not the right person for this. You know, infertility was bad enough because all these blood tests to check your hormones and, yeah. and pregnancy and, you know, but then chemo and all of that, you get, you get weekly, you get weekly blood tests for the 18 months you're getting like three or four and your veins start to pack up shop because the chemo starts to shrink your veins and they can't get in and so you're getting just like 16 needles to get one bit of blood out so for some reason another like amazing thing that comes out of it is i somehow face that fear and no longer have a phobia i was of... gonna say you've, you've cured one thing haven't you at least <laughs> you just oh have Lord. to do it so see so yeah, i had my surgery I then was told you were going to have your chemotherapy start in like two weeks time. You need two weeks to heal from your, from your surgery. But I then was told by my IVF doctors that if you wanted to harvest your eggs to create embryos with Jake to preserve any chance of future babies, because the chemo will destroy your ovaries, it will ruin your chance of kids. You have to do IVF now. So we were like, oh okay, God. let's do it. And they're like, great, you need to have a period to start and you need a new cycle. 
well, I was currently having infertility issues where I was getting too much information for you, Andy, but I was getting like 90 mm. days without a period. You're meant to get one every 28 days. So yeah. that was one of my issues as well. Like I just wasn't getting cycles. So not only did I have to wait 90 days to try again every time for a baby, I was like, well, how am I going to do my IVF if I don't get a cycle? And they said that you've got to to have this drug. We've got to give you this um tablet or injection or whatever it was and it'll take six days to give you a period then you'll start your period then you'll start your IVF round and it'll take 12 days to mm. to harvest those eggs but we only had two weeks we I was had two say, weeks the numbers don't add up. add up so we went to bed guess what happened the next morning Go woke on. up with a period woke up <sighs> with my period <laughs> I was like quick so we rang the doctor. They're like, come in now, like right now. You're starting IVF today. So we came in. They Damn. gave us the noodles. I had to self-inject my stomach, do all of that. Um, Amazing. And they said, you might only get like, you know, 10 eggs. And then you might have half of those. It, it, it halves every step along the way, right? So you'll get yeah. 10 eggs. Five of them might fertilize with Jake. Five uh, out of five of those, two or three might freeze. So you might yeah. end up with two or three eggs. So what happened after the 12 days? They got 18 eggs. <laughs> wow. So lucky again. And then out of those 18 eggs, 13 of them uh, fertilized with Jake's sperm. And then they did out of the 13, they grew them to day five embryos. They grew six of them and all six froze. So oh here my we are. Lord. Yeah. So we're in a the good headspace. It's going up. We're, we're like, shit, we're on a real, yeah, you know, yeah. all downhill from 30 years old. But then we're up again because we've got our <laughs> embryos. They're yeah. in the freezer. They've printed out my little photos of these embryos. And I've got my little baby beanie, right? And I've got these these photos and this beanie and I've taken them with me to my first day of chemo. And I'm like, these are my, my hope. I'm just going to hold on to these every single time and look at them. Yeah, it's added that little positivity pocket hasn't it to the mm. to the start of what is no doubt going to change your life even if it goes well it's going to change your life right yeah that's it so you start your so, chemo yeah. so we started our chemo we went in like all guns blazing like it's going to be fine um and i've come back jake's driven me and waited for like hours you know he sits in the car for like six hours in the car park because of covid and he waits and he waits and they're trying to get veins and they're trying to put the drug in and off you go home. They said, you probably won't lose your hair for a week or two. You might still have your hair for a couple of weeks or no, a couple of days, I think they said, um, and it'll start to fall out. And I was like, I had, you know, very long blonde hair. And so we went and got it cut oh, hold short. On. I know they you can see it, but I got my photo. <laughs> And I'm yeah, going to show do. it because it's the back of your hair. It was longer, <laughs> <And> this is... <laughs> yes. Yeah. Very long blonde hair that I had never expected to have to lose in that way. <laughs> so they yeah. cut it real short and I've had my first round of chemo and we've come home. Jake's tucked me in on the couch because it knocks you out. You're tired, right? You're a bit spaced. I'd never done anything. I'd never smoked a cigarette in my life. I'd never taken drugs. Panadol has a big effect on me. Like I'm very lightweight, <laughs> one drink of alcohol yeah. and I'm drunk. So this chemo drug hit me hard, hit me real hard. So I'm on the couch and Jake's, um, Jake's gone to the bathroom and I'm sitting there and I started hallucinating. I legit have never experienced this and I'm just seeing this massive, I can still see it, this huge window with this rain trickling down and Jake's on the other side and I'm just like, stuck in this window with rain and I'm tripping <laughs> and I'm like, wow. and then I start thinking I'm about to vomit. I, I, I can't see it in the world. The room is spinning and I'm just like, I just didn't know what was going on. So I'm just lying there yelling, Jake, Jake, but I don't think any words are coming out. You know, like a bad dream when you're a kid and you, you're yelling and no one, yeah. no one, your voice just doesn't. So I'm just like in this, this wild mental state and Jake comes down and I've just, chucked my guts up and I've vomited and I've vomited and I've vomited and he's monitoring it because he was told what to look out for on your first round of chemo. Like if you come home and you're sick, it's to be expected. But if they don't stop being sick in this amount of time, like you need to come rushing in. So we've rushed into emergency and you get this little VIP card 
and you go straight through, cut the COVID queue because they don't want COVID near anyone that's having chemo because it's, you know, your your immunity's low. So we've cut yeah. the queue. They've brought me into the uh to the to the little like emergency room where they can treat you, and they just told Jake that there's literally nothing they can do. They've just got to let the chemo run its course. She's going to be really sick and she may or may not wake up tomorrow. So Jake knew that. I didn't know that. He kept that from me. Till oh, you I didn't get told my that. Treatment. Never told me that. Wow. So he's, he's there taking on all of the stress. He was just my rock and my, yeah, he's amazing. So I'm just there like not knowing why I feel so sick. And well, I knew it was a chemo, but, they gave me drug after drug after drug. They tried about like eight different um, anti-nausea medications. And then they were like, we're out of ideas. We've got this guy from South Africa, this doctor. He wants to try this weird thing on you, like where they hold you and just rock you vigorously side to side, like literally just throw you on the bed to try right. to like fix up like your <laughs> your um like the chemical balance and the fluid in your head. I don't know. I don't, I do not understand it because I was so out of it. Did but you do it? Did you do it? it? Oh, every time he did it, I was vomiting and feeling even worse. He did it again and then he was coming back into the room to do it and I just like started crying. I said to Jake, I don't want him to do it again. <laughs> Tell him to go away. <laughs> I don't want to do heard that. Of that. I'm, I know it was weird, right? So they tried all this stuff and eventually something one of the medications finally settled or maybe his crazy crocodile wrestling what? worked i don't know yeah. <laughs> but i started to settle and i fell asleep and they let me go home they said if you eat these sandwiches and you go to the toilet you can go home so jake ate my sandwiches went to the toilet for me because i just wanted to go home <laughs> He's, we're oh, both really? free. if something's gonna happen right They've done all they can. Let's just go home where we're comfortable. So he ate my sandwiches. He did a wee. And, so he, and he, he presented. Me home. Did he say? So he presented what? Did he have to present the wee and the poo to them? Yeah, he just was like, they didn't test it. They just saw it and were like, cool, see ya. <laughs> they just discharged him. Oh. So we went home and he tucked me into bed and I slept for like twenty something hours. And then um, when I woke up, I'm like can you please check that my mum and everyone's okay? Like, I'm so worried that they'll be so worried. Um, so we checked in with everyone and he's like, everyone's fine. So I could go back to sleep, peace of mind. And then the next treatment was going to be a week later because it was every week, um, you know, for the six months, you're going to have this treatment. And I'm just thinking, oh, my gosh, I don't want to do that again. That was gross. I felt the sickest I've ever felt. I thought I was going to die. Like, I did not want to do chemotherapy again. And they you don't even did, know. Though. They, yeah, and I don't even know. They were preparing know, like, for that. Yeah. Jake was preparing for that. Yeah, I know, right? And when they put the chemo drug in, I just remembered also, yeah, that's it, Jake. That's another part. There are just the world of guilt where he, we're making him feel that. Like, that sucks. He, just, he, he, he explained that on his episode, two points mm. there. He, 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 mm. he was waiting to watch your last breath that night. And join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.